This is my first and proper CRPG experience, and so I'm coming in with a fresh set of eyes. What do I expect from Baldur's Gate and other CRPGs? I expect mediocre and overall competent visuals, but nothing crazy. I expect the gameplay to be approachable, but still complicated enough to take some time to learn, while also not being extremely engaging most of the time. And, last but certainly not least, I expect the story to be what carries all the other lower priority aspects of the game. It's the story that will matter the most, and lucky for Baldur's Gate, words and sentences aren't as reliant on technology, so they will have no reason to not have a really good story on display for this game. From a technical aspect, disk space will barely be affected by text. Also, there are no technical limitations on if a game can have good writing or bad writing, unlike something like an explosion, which will be less and less realistic the more you go back in time. Sometimes there just aren't answers made for the time of production, and that's alright. But in the case of story, not only is the limitation non-existent, but also, there are no excuses. So, what is Baldur's Gate? I'd personally describe it as a video game interpretation of a Dungeons & Dragons session, and gameplay-wise, it absolutely shows. The character customization is crazy intense for a newcomer, with terms that you'll most likely be unaware of, like me. You won't really need a guide to get by here, but it definitely won't be a bad idea to have a quick check at a glossary online. What's also crazy is how the game's combat is basically just dozens of dice rolls, being each done to determine one thing or another. It's an active pause system, so you can either let it keep going like I did, or be more micro-intensive to be more efficient. It's impressive to me even today, but I can't imagine how crazy this must have felt like back in 1998. Also, I'm playing the Enhanced Edition for obvious reasons. Overall, with modern systems, Enhanced Edition will basically completely cover you when it comes to technical issues from modern systems. And even with that, everything's done well and it's exactly what I'd expect from a modern remaster, with some upscaling here and there, quality of life updates, and a generally admirable attempt at modernizing accessibility through very small options and most importantly, difficulty. They also added some bit of content, and it shows, with the new characters having better fidelity with better writing and actually decently made scripted events. They stand out, but in a good way. So, here's the story. You grew up with an adoptive father in a gated scholar commune, and one day, you're forced to leave. Outside the commune, almost no time passes until you're ambushed by mysterious forces, who kill your father while you escape. When you regain control of the character, you get the option to have your first companion, and you're essentially free to roam the world, and it's big. The world. <clears throat> the world, that is. While you can see the limitations everywhere, the illusion of openness isn't even needed since the size of each map is genuinely impressive, and you'll likely have more to explore than you bargained for. However, that does not mean that it's all purely quality exploration. The vast majority of the maps will be 80% empty with random enemy placements, and you'll just have to accept that. Not only that, there's also no real variation since you'll either be in forests, in forests, in caves, in forests, or sometimes rarely, um, you'll also be in forests. You can make forests seem diverse, like Assassin's Creed Origins made deserts diverse, but look, I get that there are technical limitations in place, and Look, I also don't really need the Enhanced Edition to change the game a ton just to fix its previous visual limitations. The inventory system is top-tier clunk, and while it's pretty intuitive, all things considered, it's a mess. And the lack of quality of life updates is most notable here. You'll be swinging items left and right to one character or another, with one character being two pixels too far to pick something up, or just too far to transfer things. Any compulsive looter like me will have their patience well tested. The second biggest issue is the actual AI of your companions. They're not completely awful, and they'll try their best to get to a location even if it's very inefficient. But what causes true issues are the close quarters areas like tight caves, which become more common as the game progresses. Allies getting stuck in each other, causing pileups, and having other random brain aneurysms is not just common, but it's downright more regular than them pathfinding normally. In fact, the game purposely places allies within each other, if there isn't enough room for all your characters without realizing that, well, they get stuck there, forcing you to sometimes navigate a 5 minute section for like 10 minutes just because of the pathfinding troubles. But those issues are generally reasonable, acceptable, and overall expected from a game as old as this. What isn't, though, is how weak the writing is. Most side quests are one-sentence affairs, similar to quest design for 
fuck, Bethesda games. With most games being a shallow introduction to the concept of what will happen, you doing it, and then a very short ending, whether it's a thank you or whatever else could be a consequence. Also, don't expect any real choices since a huge portion of the game is written in a way that you'll have either a good or an evil option and everything else is designed to funnel you back into those main paths. The people claiming that companions are memorable are most likely talking from their nostalgia since these characters lack agency and, well, character. You'll likely have all of a character's lines within 10 sentences, and if you're interested in anything more, then you have to beg to the Almighty that the dull writing of the backstories in their character pages is enough to quell your thirst. I'm used to shallow writing and barebones quest design, but Baldur's Gate is meant to be a game with an emphasis on story and characters, and look, this just ain't it, chief. It's almost funny how there are reviews bashing the new 2016 release of a DLC as a bastardization of characters, when there weren't any characters to begin with. You can always mentally fill in gaps however you want, but the characters you pretend are there... aren't there. They didn't exist. Sadly, the main story doesn't get a better treatment either, with the first four chapters of Seven being pretty much unrelated to the story at large. It's the lack of intrigue, since there's really no reason to care for the things that are presented. Don't get me wrong. I know some people would immediately say that they cared, and that it's my fault for not being the same as them, but I also would let them know that you can care for every story, but the best stories are the ones that are well written to make you care for them, instead of having the player do the legwork of feigning interest. You can care for anything you set your mind to, but it's not your job as a player to fill in the gaps in the work of the writers. Luckily, the second half of the main tale picks up mainly due to massive conveniences that due to crazy reaches, create connections to the overarching plot that started in Chapter 1. I've heard that the second game's a huge improvement, however, and I'm more than excited to see how it continues. In 2016, an expansion, Siege of Dragon Spear, sought to fill in the gaps between the first and second game, and overall it's seen as a letdown. The reviews are mixed, and while I partially get what they mean, it's also a bit of a red herring since a huge number of negative reviews focus on people's own nostalgia and how they most certainly remember the lack of writing differently in the base game. Beamdog was never gonna win with this product, because you can never write a response and a continuation to people's imaginations. As kids, we always filled in gaps in things. There are people who unironically claim of the vast and deep exploration of Saints Row 2 when, in reality, all they saw were empty rooms with pedestrians walking in them. But that's not what they saw. They saw a hidden away oasis in the cityscape. A sprite of a store is no longer a sprite, but instead, a vital part of the community that has this and that happening to it. The three trees in the park are no longer just three trees in a park, they're a vast forest rivaling Central Park. I had that with GTA Vice City, where the basic geometry was a playground for my imagination of what Vice City truly was. But that's not what it is. That's not what it was. But when you truly believe it as such, then no matter what you do, you'll never please everyone since the expectations are created over make-believe and the various directions that people's minds went independently. But when coming in with a fresh set of eyes, what actually is Siege of Dragonspear. It's basically the broken steel to Dragonspear's Fallout 3. It's almost a direct continuation of the main story where you begin by finishing up the remnants of the base game's villainy, only to be confronted by a new evil. This is a more modern entry and, oh boy, it shows. Suddenly, there's a lot more writing everywhere. There are new visual effects and a ton of new lighting techniques. The environments are more complex visually than ever and voice acting is more common than before. Not everyone's voice acted, but all the major moments will be 90% voiced, at least. Most of the casts reprise their roles as you have the chance to pick them up once again, wearing the armors and having the attributes they did from the main adventure, giving it a true feeling of continuation. So, when now characters speak a bit more, some people will inevitably be disappointed, since they didn't expect the characters to talk like that or have that kind of personality, since their imagination led them to hope for something else. But overall, there are no characters that stand out as bad or unlikable. Everyone has their role and they fill it about as well as you'd hope. So, now that everything's done, is Baldur's Gate worth a bash? 
overall, yes, I'd say it is. Even with its shortcomings, it's still a good time, especially if you're aware of what to expect. The modern enhanced edition is also a perfect chance to experience some old times with some technical issues fixed and some bugs ironed out. Both Enhanced Edition and The Siege of Dragonspear are available for less than 10 bucks in total, around 7 euros as of writing it today. Get it, but just know what to expect and you'll have a good time. Thanks for watching.